Islamic State burns 19 women alive. Police have a new tool to seize cash wirelessly, and a boy wins all state honors at a girls' track and field championship. This is Skywatch TV for Thursday, June 9th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. First up, the Bilderberg Group reportedly set to discuss plans to eliminate anonymity on the Internet and to impose global taxes on banking and air travel. A source told Infowars.com that those topics are on the agenda as the Bilderberg Group met today in Dresden for the first of three days of meetings. According to that source, creation of a virtual passport that you'd need before you could access certain Internet services would be sold to us as necessary for cybersecurity. Of course, it could also be used to cut off your access to the web. Now, last week, it was reported that the EU is developing an Internet ID system to track what people buy and say online. And last year, China was working on developing a social credit database that would rank citizens on trustworthiness. It's getting to the point where if you know of online audio and video that you want to save or might be helpful to friends and relatives in the future, now is the time to start downloading them and burning them to disk. NATO members launched what's being called the largest war games in decades earlier this week. The 10-day exercise involves 31,000 soldiers from 24 countries, including 14,000 American troops. The exercise called Anaconda 16 is taking place in Poland ahead of next week's or next month's NATO summit in Warsaw. Uh, needless to say, um, Russia is not too happy about it. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that uh, we do not hide that we have a negative attitude toward the NATO line of moving its military infrastructure to our borders. Of course, last month, the U.S. activated its new missile defense site in Romania and earlier this year announced it was ramping up deployment of heavy weapons and armored vehicles to NATO members in Eastern Europe. Four Israelis were killed and 16 injured in a terror attack in Tel Aviv. Two Palestinians dressed as Orthodox Jews opened fire with automatic weapons at an open-air shopping district in Tel Aviv. The two men in custody now. In response, Israel has suspended entry permits into the country from 83,000 Palestinians. Hamas issued a statement praising what it called the heroic attack, but did not claim responsibility. In Iraq, the Islamic State has publicly executed 19 Kurdish women, according to witnesses in the city of Mosul. The women who were from the minority Yazidi sect were killed last Thursday, reportedly for refusing to have sex with Islamic State fighters. Witnesses told Kurdish media that the women were burned alive in iron cages in front of hundreds of witnesses. Hillary Clinton may have made an embarrassing admission of guilt last week. During what she called a major foreign policy speech last Thursday, Mrs. Clinton blasted Donald Trump for saying that he would order our military to carry out torture and the murder of civilians who are related to suspected terrorists, even though those are war crimes. The thing is, while she was Secretary of State, the Obama administration did those very things. Highest profile example, on October 14th of 2011, a U.S. drone strike killed 16-year-old Abdul Rahman al-Awlaki, along with his teenage cousin and five other civilians. Why? Because Abdul Rahman's father, Anwar al-Awlaki, was essentially a propaganda mouthpiece for al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So, Mrs. Clinton, was that a war crime or just a violation of the president's authority under the Constitution? Another moment she might want to do over, um, sharp observers noticed that Hillary delivered a speech in April about income inequality while wearing an, Amar an Armani jacket that retails for $12,495. Now, to be fair, Donald Trump often wears $7,000 suits, but then he hasn't spent most of his adult life in public service as a politician. Even on the salary of a senator or secretary of state, a $12,000 jacket is just a little pricey. A massive tsunami drill kicked off Tuesday in Washington state, being called the largest exercise of any kind in state history. The drill is to prepare for what experts say is coming a magnitude 9 earthquake along the Cascadia subduction zone, which could trigger a tsunami that experts say could kill as many as 15,000 people in Washington and Oregon. In Oklahoma, the Highway Patrol has a new device that allows them to seize cash electronically. 
This is for use during something called civil asset forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture. That's where police can take your property and money if they suspect that it's been used in a crime. They don't need to prove it, don't even need a warrant for it, but if they suspect that it is or is about to be used for the commission of a crime, they can take it. And then you have to fight through the courts to get it back. Well, this new device called the ERAD, or Electronic Recovery and Access to Data Machine, allows state police in Oklahoma to swipe your debit card and clean out your checking or banking account. State Senator Kyle Loveless from Oklahoma City told a reporter that civil asset forfeiture violates due process. And uh, the assumption under the you know, Constitution that uh, people are innocent until proven guilty. He plans to introduce legislation in the next session requiring a conviction before assets can be seized by police. And frankly, that's the way it should be in all 50 states. Well, the Target stores apparently don't care what you and I think about their new transgender bathroom policy. Spokesman for the American Family Association attended Target's company, uh, Target's company shareholders meeting in Southern California yesterday, said that he was basically snubbed by Target officials when he raised the subject. The AFA has an online uh, petition drive uh, to boycott Target, currently uh, 1.3 million signatures. And meanwhile, in Alaska, a boy has won all state honors at the girls track and field championships. Natafan Wangyat is male, but self-identifies as female. And so the Alaska School Activities Association allowed him to compete as a girl against other girls. He placed fifth in the 100 meter dash, third in the 200 meter. Some of the girls weren't very happy about that. One who competed against Wangyat said, it's the DNA. Genetically, a guy has more muscle mass than a girl. She gets it. Now, my question is this, how many situations like this will happen before feminists get involved and begin to complain? I mean, after all, this is just another tactic by the patriarchy to keep women oppressed, right? I'm only kind of joking about that. I do not expect them to complain, but then being a liberal means never having to worry about cognitive dissonance. And finally, we're going to take another go at the Mandela effect. I talked about this yesterday, and I don't bring this up again because I enjoy beating a horse that's on life support, and I'm not trying to create any public controversy between this ministry and any other ministry, because I know that there are some brothers in Christ out there who believe that the Mandela effect is real and that the Bible has, in fact, been changed in history. But I wouldn't even address this issue if it weren't for the claim by some that our Bibles have been changed. Look, the Word of God is immutable. He guaranteed it. Heaven and earth will pass away before His words pass away. But I did get some pushback, some emails yesterday expressing disagreement with my analysis. To their credit, they were all very cordial. But they believe that someone has gone back in time, possibly using the CERN Large Hadron Collider to do it, and changed the King James Bible, perhaps other English language Bibles, somewhere in the past. One of the key examples here is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer in the King James Bible reads, in earth. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, most of us learn the Lord's Prayer saying, on earth as it is in heaven. But somehow that simple little two-little word is a piece of evidence to these believers in a bigger puzzle, proving that someone or something is tampering with history, and specifically, the Bible that we thought we knew. Now, this argument, frankly, fails on logical and theological grounds. First of all, in earth is how all of the early English translations of the New Testament rendered that phrase. Not just the 1611 King James, but the 1526 Tyndale Bible and the 1389 Wycliffe Bible. The 1662 Anglican Book of Common Prayer also rendered the phrase in earth instead of on earth. So for at least 300 years, English speakers commonly said in earth, not on earth. Another thing, some people apparently are disturbed that the King James Bible and the 
Tyndale and Wycliffe Bibles, by the way, uh, read, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because we remember it said trespasses and forgive those who trespass against us. Well, first of all, it depends on what denomination you were raised in. I've been through a number of denominations in my adult life. I was raised in the United Church of Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, married a Roman Catholic, converted, converted back. I have been a member of Southern Baptist, Independent Baptist, American Baptist, United Methodist, and a regular attendee in a couple of other churches, Evangelical Free Presbyterian Church in America. And it seems like how they say the prayer changes with every time we move and or change churches. But the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, again, 1662, said trespasses, not debts. And the 1928 update of the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer says trespasses instead of debts. The King James has always said debts and debtors, not trespasses and those who trespass against us. We learned the prayer as it was written in the Book of Common Prayer, not as it was recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Now, secondly, if the King James Bible had been changed, why didn't any of the great theologians of the last 400 years notice? Why did it fall to us in the 21st century to take notice that this one little word had changed or that these phrases had been changed? None of the great theologians, Bible commentators after the 17th century, Jonathan Edwards, Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, uh, Charles Spurgeon, none of these men who devoted their entire adult lives to the study of and exposition on the Word of God noticed that their Bibles had changed? How likely is that? How likely is it that an anonymous YouTube user, someone who doesn't even put his rec real name on his YouTube account, knows more about what the Bible is supposed to say than um, George Whitfield, or D.L. Moody, or Charles Spurgeon, or, or John Wesley, Charles Finney. It doesn't make any sense. Now the reason I'm getting just a little passionate about this is because there are people who will use this and allow it to question their faith, or use it to cause others to question their faith. It may be a stumbling block to others who have not yet come to the faith. I mean, if you can't trust that the Bible is actually the Word of God, the way, it's, the way it was originally written down, how can you trust that it's true? There are a couple of very serious consequences to this line of thinking. First of all, we make ourselves the ultimate authority over the Word of God. If we trust our memories instead of what is plainly printed on the page, we are making the Word of God conform to our memories. We are making us authority over the Word of God. God's Word must submit to my memory. I've seen the face in my mirror. I'm sure that He's not God. I'm not going there. Secondly, if it is possible to travel in time and change the Word of God, how do we know, for example, that the Bible wasn't written in the future and then planted in the past in order to create a religion out of whole cloth? And believe me, there are some people who would find that easier to believe than to believe that Jesus actually came back to life after three days in the tomb. Um, of course that didn't happen. I mean, the whole Bible in the future planted in the past thing. We know that Jesus of Nazareth lived, died, and rose again on the third day because of the eyewitness testimony of those who saw him after the crucifixion. And he told us, Jesus, that heaven and earth would pass away, but his words would not pass away. Satan and his minions don't have the kind of power to go back and retroactively change the word of God. And those who are spreading this idea, frankly, are making themselves potential stumbling block to people coming to the faith. I've watched the videos of those who claim this is true. I've read the blog posts and all of the evidence for the Mandela effect, whether you're talking about the changing Bible or the spelling of Berenstain Bears, comes down to one argument. I don't remember it that way. In other words, people are more willing to believe in time-traveling agents of Satan than to believe that their memories might not be perfect. 
It needs to stop and it needs to stop now. Well, a couple of in-house notes. First of all, thank you for those of you who prayed for the safe travel of Chris and Shelley Putnam. They have made it here to the Ozarks. It was a long journey. It wasn't quite as quickly as they had hoped, but they have arrived. They've arrived safely, and thank you for that. Um, Want to make you aware this is the final week to take advantage of that crazy deal that Tom Horn is offering on the new book, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade. Still a little time left, 1995 plus shipping and handling. You get a great book plus $200 worth of additional books, DVDs, and research material. If you can take advantage of it, do it quickly. But we ask your patience because the stack of invoices that's tr going from the office out to the warehouse is huge and they're working as quickly as they can. They've called in extra help, but some of those guys that they called in to help in the warehouse because we've got great weather in the Ozarks this week, they're out bailing hay for the ponies at Whispering Ponies Ranch right now. So they're getting to them as quickly as they can, but you, we just ask your patience for a few more days. Um, plus, as they announced in the Hagman and Hagman program, speaking of Whispering Ponies Ranch, uh, Tom and Nita Horner are offering a unique way to partner with this wonderful ministry that will be open soon to help children who can be helped through these, um, these therapy animals. Um, you can sponsor a pony. There's information posted at skywatchtv.com. For $1,000, you defray the cost of food, veterinary care, uh, the farrier, uh, operating and construction cost for the facilities there at Whispering Ponies Ranch. And as a sponsor of Whispering Ponies Ranch, you will get a hoof-signed, frameable picture of the pony that you choose to sponsor and uh, a personally autographed copy of Nita Horn's memoir, No Fences, about her journey from her childhood dream to today, Whispering Ponies Ranch. Again, more information posted at skywatchtv.com. Look for the link, Sponsor a Pony, in the top menu bar. This week on Skywatch TV, Richard Shaw talks about the possibility of secret codes implanted in the Torah, the original Hebrew text of the Bible by God. Um, He's the producer and director of the film Torah Codes End to Darkness. You can see the program Saturday afternoon, 3.30 p.m. on the uh, Victory Television Network down in Arkansas. And then 7.30, no, check that, 6.30 p.m. Central Time at WCLF Television in the Tampa St. Petersburg area. Of course, the program is available now on the Skywatch TV channel on Roku and on YouTube. And if you go to the web, you'll also find exclusive web content, a second interview with Richard Shaw, that is available at the Roku channel and the YouTube channel, and you'll also find it linked at skywatchtv.com. We do appreciate your support, and every month we send out a thank you to you for your support. In the month of June, gifts just in time for Father's Day, a couple of books to help Dad cope, The Fisherman's Guide to Life, and The Man in the Mirror, Solving the Problems Men Face. We will send those to you for your donation of any amount during the month of June, while supplies last, Canada and U.S. only, please. Uh, you'll find more information, and you can donate by logging on to skywatchtv.com slash donate. And you can also help us by spreading the word about Skywatch TV. Click like, click share, and of course, click subscribe. The button is down here. I got it wrong last time. You'll find... <laughs> We do appreciate, just the mouse click helps us a great deal. And if you've got questions, comments, or suggestions for me, please send those to dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. Tomorrow, Sci Friday with my best friend, our science editor, Sharon K. Gilbert. Until then, thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Save nearly half off the cover price when you subscribe now to the brand new Skywatch TV magazine. For a limited time from April 24th through June 24th, 60 days only, a five-year subscription to Skywatch TV magazine is just $99. That's more than $75 off the cover price, which is like getting two years for free. Exclusive content, articles on prophecy, discovery and the supernatural from Tom Horn, Chris Putnam, Josh Peck, science updates from Sharon K. Gilbert, geopolitics from yours truly, and guest writers like Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist Troy Anderson, renowned Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, Pentagon advisor Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, and more. But there is more. As an early subscriber, you'll be the first to get this new book from Defender Publishing, I Predict What 12 Global Experts Believe You'll See by 2025. This is a $20 value and includes best-selling authors like Joel Richardson, Mark Biltz, Carl Gallops, Tom Horn, Paul McGuire, and more. Find out what they think about the coming war between ISIS and the Vatican, the future of the Temple Mount, and the Ark of the Covenant a worldwide manifestation of angels and the coming age of human hybrids, and 
We'll also add this DVD, The Best of Skywatch TV 2015, a $25 value, including our most compelling interviews from last year, including Chuck Missler, Steve Quayle, the discussion of the Georgia Guidestones with Chris Pinto, and more. All of this together worth more than $200, yours now for just $99, but only through June 24th. Subscribe now, Skywatch TV Magazine. Just call the number on your screen or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Islamic State burns 19 women alive. Police have a new tool to seize cash wirelessly, and a boy wins all state honors at a girls' track and field championship. This is Skywatch TV for Thursday, June 9th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. First up, the Bilderberg Group reportedly set to discuss plans to eliminate anonymity on the Internet and to impose global taxes on banking and air travel. Uh, we do not hide that we have a negative attitude toward the NATO line of moving its military infrastructure to our borders. Of course, last month, the U.S. activated its new missile defense site in Romania and earlier this year announced it was ramping up deployment of heavy weapons and armored vehicles to NATO members in Eastern Europe. Four Israelis were killed and 16 injured in a terror attack in Tel Aviv. Two Palestinians dressed as Orthodox Jews opened fire with automatic weapons at an open-air shopping district in Tel Aviv, the two men in custody now. In response, Israel has suspended entry permits into the country from 83,000 Palestinians. Hamas issued a statement praising what it called the heroic attack but did not claim responsibility. In Iraq, the Islamic State has publicly executed 19 Kurdish women, according to witnesses in the city of Mosul, the women who were from the minority Yazidi sect were killed last Thursday, reportedly for refusing to have sex with Islamic State fighters. Witnesses told Kurdish media that the women were burned alive in iron cages in front of hundreds of witnesses. Hillary Clinton may have made an embarrassing ed it's getting to the point where if you know of online audio and video that you want to save or might be helpful to friends and relatives in the future, now is the time to start downloading them and burning them to disk. NATO members launched what's being called the largest war games in decades earlier this week. The 10-day exercise involves 31,000 soldiers from 24 countries, including 14,000 American troops. The exercise called Anaconda 16 is taking place in Poland ahead of next week's or next month's NATO summit in Warsaw. Uh, needless to say, um, Russia is not too happy about it. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that a source told Infowars.com that those topics are on the agenda as the Bilderberg Group met today in Dresden for the first of three days of meetings. According to that source, creation of a virtual passport that you'd need before you could access certain internet services would be sold to us as necessary for cybersecurity. Of course, it could also be used to cut off your access to the web. Now, last week, it was reported that the EU is developing an internet ID system to track what people buy and say online. And last year, China was working on developing a social credit database that would rank citizens on trustworthiness.